I want to thank you for joining us today. We're so glad that you're here. You know, we exist as a church to help you experience all that Jesus is so that you can become all you were meant to be. So if the ministry of Crossroads Church has impacted you in any way, we'd love to hear about it. Let us know your story at mycrossroadschurch.com. You can also help us to continue sharing the hope of Jesus around the globe by investing into our ministry. To do so, simply visit us at mycrossroadschurch.com give or by downloading the My Crossroads app and selecting give. Thanks again for joining us and I hope you enjoy today's message. How you guys doing today? Yes, there. I, I know those of you that are online, you can't see them, but they're here. Um, hey, for those of you that are here, would you guys just give like an enormous shout out uh, to the people joining us, our family that's joining us online? Come on, let me hear you guys. We love you guys, and we're so glad that you are joining us today. Um, we started a series last week called Heal Our Land. Uh, you all, I, I know I don't need to tell you this, but this is a timely word, a God word, uh, and it's coming straight from Scripture. And, um, you know, uh, this, this title, Heal Our Land, uh, comes from this promise that God gives us in 2 Chronicles 7.14. And we'll have it on the screen so you can read it along. I would encourage you to memorize this scripture. I would encourage you to meditate and really allow it to, to churn in your heart because this is, this is if you want to know what our stance as a church is, uh, this is it right here. So 2 Chronicles 7.14 says this, if my people, everybody say my people. If my people, say it again, my people. Who's God's people? We are. If my people, if my church, who is called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will forgive their sin and will heal their lands. And that is a promise from God. And God's promises never return void. And he tells us that, that as we look across this land, as we look across our nation and we see brokenness and division, and we may even feel the brokenness in our community, and we may have friends that, that have been a little distant lately and things have felt very tense in the atmosphere, we have a promise from God Almighty who sits on the throne of this universe, and, and he has promised us that if we, his church, his people, would humble themselves and pray and seek his face, and turn from our wicked ways, then he will hear from heaven, and he will forgive our sins, and he will heal our land. That's a promise that we can take to the bank. That's a promise from God that, that we don't need to hope for, we don't need to wish for. This is a promise from God that we can walk in and believe in and watch with expectancy and watch God do what he says that he's going to do. Last week, we talked about how healing in our nation, healing in this world, healing in our community, it starts with me. Why? Because the Bible says that we are a temple of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says he has chosen this temple to be a place of worship. He has chosen us to be a temple of God. His spirit lives in us. And if Jesus lives in us, the only one who can heal our world, then it starts with us. It starts with me. It starts with Jesus in me. But I want to expand that thought this week. Last week, we talked about how it starts with me. This week, I want to talk about the power of we. The power of we. That's the title for my message today. And I don't think that there is anyone that can hear my voice right now that would dispute with me that our land needs healing. I don't think there's any person that turns on the news or reads the newspaper or scrolls through social media and would dispute and argue with me that our land is broken. Our land needs healing. Our land needs healing in every way imaginable. Physically, as pandemic has spread across our nation, emotionally, mentally, as we have all been in this crazy, strange, weird time of social isolation and quarantine. 
And we are absolutely, there is no doubt about it, that we are in need of a spiritual healing as well. We're facing some of the greatest challenges that our generation has ever known. We are all in this odd, weird time that that no one living today has ever seen in their lifetime. Did you know that that since the stay-at-home orders began and, 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 and quarantine became a norm, did you know that since then alcoholism, divorce, and suicide rates have skyrocketed? Did you know that that since the pandemic took the world by storm and forced us into isolation, that that alcohol use has gone up, that that uh, prescription drug use has gone up, that that people are finding themselves more lonely and more depressed and more anxious than they ever have been before. And and as as we are facing this upheaval, this this recent explosion of racial tension in our world has it, it's exposed this deeply rooted pain, this deeply rooted pain of injustice and oppression of our black brothers and sisters, and the enormity of it all comes at us like a tidal wave. Sometimes it feels so much bigger than we are. You and me, we look at the problems of this world and we think, what's the use? What can I do? How can I possibly uh, contribute to the healing of our land? You know, a million opinions and a million sound bites are flying at us a, like a mile a minute. We're not even halfway through this year and we're all left with more questions than we have answers. We're tired. We're scared, we're angry, we're lonely. We need a move. We need God to heal our land. We need a move. God, we need you to move in our land. We need you to heal our land. But what do we do when, when we're left in this place of, of feeling so small and, and so insignificant when we're facing this enormous tidal wave of, of division and sickness and disease and, and we're facing all of this and we're left with more questions than answers? What do we do? Bible says to pray. Second Chronicles 7:14 says to pray, to seek his face. And Jesus actually taught us how to pray. Jesus pulled his disciples together and he said this is how you should pray. And then he modeled it for them. He said, "Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth." as it is in heaven. He told us to pray that earth would look like and smell like and and act like and feel like heaven. He told us to pray that. He said, pray to the king and ask that his kingdom would come to earth, that his will, as it is in heaven, it would be just the same on earth. What's it like in heaven? I don't think any of us have actually been to heaven before. So we don't, how how do we even know how to pray? God, let, let heaven come to earth. Let your will as it is in heaven come to earth. How do we even pray that when we don't even really know what heaven is like? We haven't been there before. Well, the apostle John while he was exiled on the island of Patmos, he, he was given a vision of heaven. And, and, and so I figured since none of us have been to heaven, why don't we, uh, why don't we go to John and see what he says that he saw there in heaven. In Re- Revelation chapter 7, starting in verse 9, this is what John saw. He said, I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation and every tribe. And every people and every language standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. That's Jesus, by the way. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands. And they were shouting with a great roar. Salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. Now, if you can just with me picture in your mind... Imagine seeing every color, every race, 
every tribe, every nation, every language. And if you actually do a study of the word of, of every tongue, every language, it, it's not just like, like English and, and you know, um, Spanish and French. It actually, that, that, that word, um, every tongue, it actually means every dialect. So even within, you know, English-speaking nations, it's every dialect. In every Spanish-speaking nation, every dialect, every tribe, it is such a wide, diverse beautifully, this beautiful array of colors and, and ethnicities, every kind imaginable, a vast crowd, and they all were standing together before the throne of God. It doesn't say that they all looked the same. It says they all looked very different, yet they were all there worshiping God together in unity. I love how they all said in unison, salvation comes from our God. They all said, we are here, we look different, we sound different, we worship different, we speak different, everything is different about us, but we are all here together for one reason and one reason only, and that is because we are here to worship our God. You know, yesterday... My family, along with some of my friends here at Crossroads, we had the opportunity to be a part of a multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-generational, uh, church-wide. And when I say church-wide, I mean the Church of Fredericksburg. I don't mean a church title, the Church of Fredericksburg. I mean the Big C Church of Fredericksburg. We had close to 50 churches represented together. We started at Old Mill Park, and we marched all the way up to, to uh, Market Square. And there, we the entire time, it was in the spirit of intercession and prayer and asking for God's kingdom to come in our land. And we walked all the way together, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, every nationality that you can imagine. We all walked together in unity with one voice, praising the same God. And then we reached Market Square. And every single one of us knelt on the ground on the hot pavement for eight minutes and 46 seconds. I, I think if you watch the news, you know what the significance of that time is. And let me just say, it was an awful long time. Kneeling on hot pavement for eight minutes and 46 seconds, it was a long time. But can I just tell you, as we knelt there, and as this, this, in this moment of silence, yet in this moment of intercession, praying, God, would you break the back of injustice? Would you break the, the back of racism in our land? God, would you restore what has been broken? Would you bring healing to this land? Can I just tell you that the power and the presence of God was so present in, in our midst as we all in unity knelt before the same God. We all look different. We all sound different. We are so many differences amongst us. And yet we all came for one reason. And that was to lift up the name of God and to ask that he would heal our land. And can I just say, as we walked together and we prayed together and we sang together and we knelt together, that, that I believe that was a taste of heaven. I believe that what we experienced yesterday, one body, one church, many different colors, many different uh, church communities, that as we joined together, I believe that we experienced just a glimpse, just a taste of heaven here on earth. I, I, I can only say this because I read it in my Bible, that heaven looks like diversity, Heaven looks like diversity, but it doesn't look like just one race over here and one race over here and one language over here and another language over here. Heaven looks like diversity, every color, every ethnicity, every language, a brilliant array of diversity that, that all of the differences coming together in a place of unity. There is power in we. There is power in we. Just three things that I want to talk about today that, that describe the power that we have when we are joined together in unity. Number one, together is better. Now, I know that that sounds like a cheesy little phrase, but can I just illustrate it for you? 
Together is better. Now, the colors of a rainbow, they're all beautiful individually. We can appreciate each color of the rainbow individually because they're all so different. And they each have different qualities and tones. And every individual color of the rainbow is beautiful in itself. But when it's put together, it's magnificent. It's something to behold. I think about this worship team that we just all were led in to the presence of God with, with vocalists. Every single one of our vocalists have different tones. They have different uh, styles. They have different ways of, of allowing God to use the giftings that God's given them. All of our instruments, they all have a completely different sound. But, and, and we can appreciate every single member of our worship team. If they were to come and just and, and give it to you, that just an individual vocalist or an individual instrumental, that, that we could appreciate them as individuals. But when they come together in unity, something magnificent happens. Better is, together is better. Together is better. Now, I love chocolate. I do. I love chocolate. It's one of my favorite favorite foods. In fact, a couple of years ago, um, when I was uh, diagnosed with acid reflux, I was told that I needed to cut my chocolate consumption down. I wasn't too happy with that. <laughs> but I love chocolate. Chocolate is delicious. I, I could eat chocolate a million different ways. I like dark chocolate. I like milk chocolate. It's so good. Peanut butter. I don't know. I, I, I feel really sorry for you if you have allergies to peanuts, but Peanut butter. You know, I can remember as a kid coming home from school and getting a big old spoon and, and scooping up, and that was my after-school snack, was a scoop of peanut butter. So chocolate is really good on its own. Peanut butter is really good on its own. But when you put the two together, heaven falls on this earth. Some of you are really jealous right now. And I'm wondering how I'm going to preach with peanut butter in my mouth. But I can just tell you, heaven in my mouth, the glory has fallen. Together is better. Chocolate is good on its own. Peanut butter is good on its own. When it's put together, it's so much more enjoyable. It, it, it's, it has a richer flavor. Together is better. And see, kingdom oneness doesn't mean that we all come together and we all look the same and we all sound the same and we all act the same and we all think the same. That's bland and boring. And my creator, God, the awesome creator, is the master artist and he is definitely not boring. If he wanted us to all look the same and sound the same and act the same, he would have created us that way. But he didn't. He created us all different. And kingdom oneness is when our differences and our distinctions enhance and enrich us. You know, in the world, our differences divide us, don't they? Well, you act like this, so you need to stand over here. And you believe this, so you need to be over here. Politics tells us you either have to be left or right. You know, like, like this whole racial thing says, well, you're, you're black, so you stand on this corner, and you're white, you stand on this corner. Listen, in the kingdom, kingdom with, with kingdom oneness, the world, it tells us that, that differences divide us, but kingdom oneness says that differences enrich us. Differences make us better. It, it makes the flavor so much more rich and enjoyable. Now, kingdom oneness the oneness of heaven, what we see is happening in, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> what we see happening in heaven is this diverse crowd praising one God, this kingdom oneness, this kind of kingdom oneness is not an easy task. Reconciliation, racial healing, it's hard work. Unity is hard work. You know, I see, I've heard so many times married couples and, and they'll say, we've been married for 60 years and everyone in the room claps and they think, and, and what do we do? We go, 
Aww. But if they were to actually tell you that there were seasons where they almost didn't make it. There were seasons where unity was not the case in their marriage. And you may look at them and they're on their 60th wedding anniversary and say, oh, but there were times in their marriage where they almost didn't stay together. And why are they still together after 60 years? It's because they worked hard for reconciliation. It's because they pushed through the pain. Reconciliation is hard work. Healing takes time. And here we read in Ephesians 4, three, uh, verses 3 through 4, it says, make every effort to keep yourselves united. Effort. He uses the word effort. It's not something that comes easily. It's not something that comes magically. He says, make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourself together with peace. Binding, he's using these action words. This is not something that happens passively. We have to make every effort to bind ourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one spirit, not a lot of bodies, one body of Christ. And and all of us working together with one spirit of God, just as you've been called to one glorious hope, for the future. Do you want to know what hard work looks like in reconciliation? Do you really want to know? Because it's not comfortable and it's not easy and it is hard work and it does take time. The hard work of reconciliation, the hard work of being a bridge builder and and bridging the gap that is between different races and ethnicities and and, and people that don't look like us, the hard work of that is actually... Going to them and having hard conversations with them and asking them questions that you might never, ever feel comfortable asking. That hard work of reconciliation looks like doing life together. Reconciliation, the hard work of it looks like, like calling them and asking them how they're doing right now. Whoever them is to you. And let me just say, whoever them is, it's someone that doesn't look like you. And that you would do life with them. That you would rejoice and celebrate when they have a win. And you would weep with them when they have a loss. That you would walk in the good times and the hard times. But the the key to this is that you would walk together. You're different You think differently. You may even believe differently. You may have completely different political affiliations. You may not act like them at all. But listen, when we do life together, that is the hard work of reconciliation. It's not easy, and it takes time. And it takes every effort for that unity to happen. But Romans 12, 15 says this, to be happy with those who are happy and to weep with those who weep. Have you wept with anyone lately? Have you felt their pain with them? Have you you rejoiced with them? Have you walked with them in good times and in bad? You know, soldiers don't become brothers until they're in the trenches together. Like during boot camp, they're just soldiers. But it's in the trenches where that brotherhood is built. So let's work towards that church. Let's work towards going into the trenches, going into the battlefields, going into the places that are uncomfortable, and let us be the bridge builders, and let us establish a true brotherhood in the body of Christ. Together is better. The second thing that I would say, the power of we is this. Togetherness and unity mirrors God. Togetherness, our togetherness as a church is the mirror image of God. You can't get any more powerful than that. You want to know what the power of we is? It's when we look like God. You can't get any more powerful than looking and acting like God. Did you know that Jesus prayed for me? Historically, Jesus prayed for me. It is documented 
in scripture that Jesus prayed for Christina Lowry. He also prayed for you. Jesus actually prayed for me and you thousands of years ago. In John chapter 17, starting with verse 20, Jesus was getting ready to go to the cross and he was having one of his last conversations with God. And he's praying for his disciples that were there with with him at the time. So in John chapter 17, verses 20, it says, this is Jesus speaking. I am praying not only for these disciples who are with me now, but also for all who will ever believe in me. That's us. Jesus prayed for us. Let's see what he prayed for. He says, I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe that you sent me. Jesus prayed for our unity. And I have to wonder, since he was fully man and fully God at the same time, I have to wonder, when he prayed this prayer, did he see a flash of all the seasons in the, in the different times of our world where the church is at odd, odds and the church is divided and the church is split with so many different opinions and denominations. And I wonder if he pictured us here in 2020 where, where we are finding this tension in the atmosphere and Jesus Jesus prayed to the Father, make them one as you and I are one. He prayed that we would be one. And if he prayed that we, his church would be one, then, you, then that is absolutely, clearly the will of God. If he prayed it, that is what he wants. If he prayed it, he wants it. But look at this in 1 John Chapter 4, verse 12, it says, No one has ever seen God. But if we love each other, God lives in us. And his love is brought to full expression in us. That is so powerful, you guys. That when we love each other the way Christ and the Father have love for each other, when we love each other, we become a mirror image of God. And that even though the world has never seen God, guess what? They see him when they see us love each other. These are the words of of someone who was with Jesus every single day. He says, if we love each other, God lives in us and his love is brought to full expression in us. When believers of every race When believers who don't look the same and talk the same or act the same love each other well, we can become the mirror image of God to a world who has never seen him. That's powerful. There's power in our we. And as I close today, the third and final way that there is power in our we is this, together invites revival. Together invites revival revival. In the book of Acts, as the early church is forming, we read that that there's this major theme of unity and togetherness amongst the believers. The Bible says that, that as the church grew, that they gave everything that they owned to each other that they were constantly meeting together in in meals and they were constantly giving to each other financially and no one had lack because they were all one together. And the, and the, 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 the social way things were set up back then is actually very similar to, to the way things are right now. Diversity was everywhere. They lived in the Roman Empire. And so even though there was a Jewish community, there were Greeks, there were were Romans, there were people from every different part of the world living around them. And here we see the early church, this major theme of unity. In chapter two, it says when, uh, verse one, it says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Now that word, one accord, is a Greek word that's used 10 times in the book of Acts. That Greek word is homothumidin. And I know that's a mouthful. Homothumidin means one voice, one passion. So it says that that they were all gathered together with one voice and one passion. 
And we're just going to read, you know, the, the day of Pentecost traditionally was celebrated just a couple of weeks ago. And so this is the one, there's 10 instances of homothumidan unity, one voice, one passion, uh, all throughout the book of Acts. But one thing that I can tell you is that when this kind of unity happened, God moved always in a powerful way. So we're going to read what happened on the day of Pentecost when they joined together with one accord, with homothumidan unity, with, with one passion and one voice. It says they were gathered together in one accord and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it appeared to them in divided tongues as of fire and one sat upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance and they were dwelling in Jerusalem. Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. There it is, diversity right there. Jews from every nation were gathered together on the day of Pentecost. And it says, when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard these disciples speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, look, not all of these who speak are Galileans. Aren't they all Jews? How are they speaking my language? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in, in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamph Pamphylia, Egypt and all the parts of Libya adjoining Serene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own languages, the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed. Now, for the sake of time, I wish we could keep reading because this is an incredible, powerful story. I would encourage you to go back and read Acts 2 on your own. But just to give you a synopsis of what happened, these people were amazed and perplexed as the Holy Spirit came in that homothumid and unity. And so Peter, who had just weeks before been wallowing in his shame of the cowardice that he displayed when Jesus was led to the cross, and, and as he as he. Uh, denied that he was a follower of Jesus, not once, not twice, but three times. This same man who is now transformed by the Spirit's power stands up and delivers his very first sermon to this richly diverse crowd. Every color, every race, and every nation under heaven was gathered together in this crowd. And Peter gives the gospel to them. And, and there were, the Bible actually says that 3,000 of the people in that crowd gave their lives to Jesus. 3,000 people who walked into that day, walked into that crowd, divided by their color, divided by their nationality, divided by their ethnicity. But 3,000 people who heard the word of the Lord left that place as one left that place as one. The power of we, the power of homothumid and unity, one voice, one passion is this, is that it invites revival. Souls come to him when we are at, as one, as Jesus and the Father are one. Would you guys stand with me? We're going to pray. There's power there's power in we. There's power in our togetherness. Our togetherness is better. It mirrors God. It looks like God. It sounds like God and feels like God. And our togetherness invites revival. And I want to ask you, what bridge do you need to build this week? What relationship do you need to press into a little bit more? Who do you need to walk with in their pain? Who do you need to walk with in their, in their joy? Who are those that, that God has put in your life? Maybe you don't have anyone surrounding you. Maybe you need to go find somebody. But we are the church. We are the bearers of Christ's image. And we are the ones. It starts with us in the power of we. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, come. In this moment, I ask that you would speak to your sons and daughters. 
And, and God, I ask that you would put images in our mind, that you would put action steps in our heart, even right now, of things that we need to do, things that we need to say, apologies that need to be given, that we would become a, a restorative people, that we would become people that build bridges and don't cause divides. God, we are, are giving ourselves to you surrendering to you that we will be the hands and feet of healing and reconciliation in our community. Here we are, send us. Thank you, Jesus. And and I just want to invite those of you who want to be a part of this togetherness. You say, I'm not a part of the family of God. I I, I like what I'm hearing. I I like the thought of Jesus being my savior. And if that's you and you want to give your life to Jesus today and follow him and to become a part of this family so that we can show the hope and light and forgiveness and healing of Jesus. I'm going to say a prayer and ask that you join me and, and let Jesus into your life. Let him be the Lord of your life. Jesus, I'm a sinner in need of a savior. Come into life today. I invite you to come and to cleanse me of all of my sins. And Lord, I choose to follow you today and for the rest of my life. I choose to give myself to you. And Lord, let me be a part of the healing in this land. Let me be a part of the light that is shining in the darkness. Let me be a part of the reconciliation, the healing in our land. Take my life today, God. I follow you, and I am now your son, your daughter, your child, and I love you, and I thank you. It's in Jesus' name, everybody said together, amen, amen. Well, thank you guys for joining us online, and all of you that are here today, um, I really believe that it starts with us, and there is power in our we. So let's be the church. Let's be the light this week. We love you guys. Bye to everybody online. God bless you guys.